everybody, I'm Mark Hunt. Welcome to episode two of the series, Building Taylor's Wave. As you can see, construction has moved into the French Broad River now. I'm standing on top of what will ultimately be the first of the two cofferdams to be used in the project. The cofferdam will actually extend from here downstream a little ways and then back over towards shore to create a big area inside the cofferdamming. Pumps will be used to keep the water out of that area and that will expose the river bedrock so that the ledge can be installed. The ledge structure that's gonna be built by our contractor Baker Grading will start at a point right about there on shore and ultimately extend across the river perpendicular to the banks. The ledge is gonna be built in two sections. The first section will be inside this cofferdammed area. And once it's complete, all this cofferdamming will be taken up and moved to the opposite side of the river to create a new dried out area so that the second part, the final part of the ledge can be constructed right over here. Future episodes are gonna document those construction steps as they unfold. Today's episode is gonna be about design. The aim here is for Taylor's Wave to be a truly world-class surfing wave. In order for that to happen, an exacting, well-executed design is required. So what we've done here is created a model that mimics the exact dimensions of the French Broad River in Woodfield. And so you can see we've done a laser scan of the riverbed itself. You can see these bedrock protrusions, which mimic the real bedrock that's in the river. And in fact, if you look closely on the sides here, you can see the outlines of some old bridge pylons, which had been in the river, which are currently in the river, had been in the model. Um, we ran the model with the bridge still in place, and then we expect to remove it. And so we've removed it from the model. You can see that in the white area there where we dragged it down. Um, you can start to see how we've superimposed our improvements upon that existing riverbed. So the railroad bed's removed. We've got some bank terracing where the beach area and access is. This will all be natural rock and not concrete as the color implies. And then the drop structure itself is built to span the French Broad River. On this side is our recreational feature. Um, that'll be for the kayakers and the, the more adventurous folks who are ready to take on that whitewater. On that far side is our, is our safe boater bypass and fish passage. The fish passage is created out of natural stone. It's protruding up from the riverbed to create that natural river roughness that fish use for velocity barriers as they navigate upstream through the French Broad. Um, we'll have that transition area in here. It lower flows just like a natural river. It'll be deeper in the center. And then as, it's, as it gets higher and higher, those flows will spread out to the sides. We will have some natural boulder clusters as you go downstream. Those are velocity barriers for fish as well as people, so that'll be our skills development area. The drop structure itself is designed to take the flows of this very wide, broad river, hence the name, and narrow it into one slot so we can efficiently create a hydraulic jump to surf on. This low flow shot slot is the lowest in elevation across the whole structure. So at those lower flows, sort of 700 to 1,000 CFS, this slot will start to fill up and then the water will spread outward into the medium flow slot. And then as it gets higher and higher, we expect it to flow over the high flow parts of the structure. The intent is that we create that wave in this central slot so that at these bigger flood levels, we're not creating a river wide hydraulic that can capture somebody in a way they didn't want to be. Um, you can see that we've excavated into the bedrock to allow room for that hydraulic jump to occur. And then as we started tuning, we found that um, we get better results with these adjustable blocks that we'll be able to place on top of that low flow chute. Um, and also increasing the efficiency of flow as it comes into uh, the drop structure itself. So that's a great walkthrough with Scott Shipley of the design based on our physical model in the lab. And we'll return in a few minutes to look at that model with water flowing through it in the lab. But let's take a minute and zoom out and let me just talk you through some bigger picture elements of design. The first step back in 2016 was finding a suitable site. And to do that, Scott and I hopped in boats to cruise the French Broad through Woodfin. 
During that paddling outing, we were not coming up with good places for a wave to be placed in the river for a variety of factors. But when we got to this spot right here, the place that we're now under construction, it was a real eureka moment for Scott. As Scott described that day, it met the critical requisites. First, the French Broad has generous flow year round. Second, there was just enough gradient extending upstream from the site to be able to add a drop structure. Third, it was very near an existing park to support access for people, and it had a rare attribute, the existence of a large man-made landfill immediately on shore. You see, adding mass into the river or floodplain, which is what the ledge structure would ultimately do, would have the effect of increasing upstream flood elevations. The plan could be to remove a big portion of the landfill, which would have the effect of lowering flood levels, and hopefully that would be just enough to offset the rise effect that the lead structure would cause. Not only that, but landfills just don't belong on the edges of rivers where floods can wash them downstream. Removing part of this landfill would have a great environmental benefit. Our second step was to engage with the town of Woodfin and ask them to commission a feasibility study in hydraulic analysis by S2O. After passing the hat for funding of those efforts within the private community, the town gladly agreed. The research and findings from those studies verified and helped fine tune the understanding of specific siting, design parameters, outlook for permitting approvals, and even an estimate of construction costs. And the vision that was laid out in those plans resulted in the town of Woodfin formally agreeing to lead the project and create the wave and other aspects as part of its town park system. Keep in mind that S2O's role is to design just the wave structure that would be in the riverbed, basically between the banks. Once the town acquired the four acre site that included the landfill, a separate master plan and feasibility study was developed for the town by landscape architecture firm Equinox. Equinox and S2O worked hand in hand to assure great integration, especially as to how the landfill removal would work. We'll take a closer look at the onshore park design in a future episode. By 2022, sufficient funding was in place so that the town of Woodfin could move forward and commission detailed design, both for the in-stream work and the onshore work. For S2O, that started with getting a very precise topographic survey of the site, the shoreline areas, and especially including detailed topo mapping of the bedrock of the river. We were very lucky to have a great firm, key mapping and surveying, here in town to provide the needed data. The folks at Key are whitewater paddlers themselves, and they've gone the extra mile in their role. S2O uses some pretty sophisticated hydraulic engineering software to design with. And once the survey data was layered in, Scott and his team were able to develop a near final model for the ledge feature. These are a couple of outputs from that computer modeling. On this 3D version, you'll recognize all the features that Scott pointed out earlier in the physical model. Designing a great in-stream whitewater park feature is a little bit like designing an F1 racing car or a new airplane. It's one thing to design it in the computer and get it to a condition of pretty good. It's a different thing to take it into a wind tunnel and make sure it performs properly. In our case, it meant subjecting the computer design of the ledge to a scale model in the hydraulics lab. And the best one of those in the world is the Czech Technical University in Prague. This is a step that some whitewater park efforts skip due to the cost. Because we're committed to building a world-class wave, we raised the needed funds to ensure that we could do the physical modeling. In the lab, the survey and the design data allowed for laser tools to carve and shape a very, very precise 1 30th scale model of the ledge feature and the French Broad Riverbed. Pumps are able to circulate water at different amounts through the model, closely replicating flow ranges typically seen in the French Broad. And the wave shape that results is a highly reliable scaled version of what would happen in the river. Our design team spent more than 12 days total in the lab, shaving down certain areas and adding fill in other areas and testing it over and over again at various flow levels to get to an optimum design. 
A really interesting feature of the design is the ability to mount and reposition a movable concrete plate or block on the face of the low flow channel bottom. Scott mentioned it earlier. The design team discovered in the modeling process that placing the plate there improved the shape of the resulting wave significantly and that by repositioning and even resizing the plate, a simple cast concrete object, the shape of the wave could be changed. As a result, it was decided that the design would have the surface of the low flow channel bottom finished with smooth concrete and with stainless steel tracks called unistrut fixed into the surface. That way, the wave plate could be attached with recessed bolts. Since repositioning or changing the size of the wave plate would require temporary diversion of the water and a machine to move the heavy plate, adjustments would be very infrequent in the future and aimed only at tuning in order to get to the best permanent position and wave shape. Once the design was finalized, precise measurements were taken and fed back into the computer to update the design. A point to emphasize here is that since the French Broad does flow at a variety of levels depending on season and rainfall, a lot of effort has gone into optimizing the design over as broad a range of flows as possible. The surfing experience though will be different at different flows. We know that from our experiences on whitewater rivers in general. Yeah, so right now what we were seeing at, at the lower flows, we're actually seeing more of a green wave and um, it looks totally surfable, variable. It's actually was a couple feet high um, and all green and open. And it was actually across that entire uh, low water plate. So you're looking at something that uh, it probably was as wide as 20 feet, probably by the time it was down at the waves um, and looked totally surfable. Then as the water has come up and we just earlier today tested um, around 1200, I believe 11, 1200. And it actually started to break just a little bit. That uh, the low water test was at 950. Then the next test we did today was at 11, 1200, and it, you could just see it starting to break. And then we hit the what we consider to be the real sweet spot is in that two to 2200, 2250 range. And we started to get a really sweet little break in the middle and two shoulders out both sides. I mean, how cool would that be? I got to work on my left one. I got to work on my right one. I got a <laughs> little backstab, baby. Come on. And um. And then the other nice thing about that pile was it was real even and both shoulders were spinning tightly. And that's where you can start working on all the different hole moves going either direction. Um, it, it's pretty exciting to me. A key part of the process starting at the very beginning with the master planning has been engagement with stakeholders and citizens listening to and considering input. That included in Prague even holding a live stream session while we were testing the model with about 50 individuals. Permitting for any project that significantly alters a riverbed or a floodplain is rigorous for a good reason. It is vital that a project not harm the environment or worsen flood risk. S2O and Equinox did a great job of working closely with the Army Corps of Engineers and other permitting agencies to generate environmentally sensitive designs. The project was approved and permitted with very few wrinkles as a result. According to geologists, the French Broad is one of the seven oldest rivers on Earth. And ecologists consider the Southern Blue Ridge Mountain region through which it flows as Earth's most biodiverse region outside the tropics. The 1,000 square mile French Broad watershed upstream of the site of Taylor's Wave is nearly entirely intact, meaning that it has just a few small dams on the upper reaches of its tributaries and none on its main stem. Very few watersheds in the U.S. are unimpeded at that scale. As a result, the connected ecosystems of the French Broad that support aquatic life are vital and precious. There is, however, a major dam on the French Broad, the Craggy Dam, which is located less than a mile downstream of the wave site. It is owned by the Metropolitan Sewerage District, our regional wastewater authority. And in the months leading up to the construction of Taylor's Wave, a formal feasibility study was launched by the nonprofit American Rivers in coordination with MSD to consider removal of that dam. A key aim for dam removal would be to expand the scale of the connected watershed and ecosystem. 
All these factors led to two important design considerations. First, it was clearly vital that the lead structure not impede the movement of aquatic life upstream and down. This would be especially crucial if Craggy Dam is indeed removed. Scott Shipley described for us earlier in the video a bit about the design of the fish passage feature of the ledge. For that design, S2O engaged Dr. Ashley Fickey of GEI Consultants, one of the leading authorities on the subject. With her oversight, design for the fish passage consisted of modeling multiple channel geometries to find the best combination of a low slope, roughened riffle style bypass. The design uses natural materials, including strategically placed boulders to limit velocities and provide sufficient depth, allowing for migration of target species native to the French Broad through the project site. The second concern relates to the fact that the reservoir created by Craggy Dam extends upstream to just below the site for the wave. There is some chance that function and shape of the wave could be affected if the dam is removed. S2O studied that and did some modeling of it in the lab. While it would be premature to design or construct solutions that might be needed, S2O has said that adaptation should be modest and readily attainable. A key step, of course, is for the town to engage a skillful, capable contractor willing to work into, in a river that might flood occasionally one that will work to the excruciating detail required for a world-class surfing wave. Baker Grading is just that kind of builder. We're lucky to have them and their team is as excited as the rest of us for a great project. S2O will have staff on site frequently to monitor and advise in the construction process. My own role in all this is as a supporter, a cheerleader at times, an advisor at times. It goes without saying, I think, that a great project requires great project administration. The town of Woodfin and all the partners involved deserve enormous credit for the role they are playing in overseeing this ambitious project. Oh, and here's a quick update on construction progress. During the time I've been editing this video, laying of the cofferdam has gone quickly. A few more days of work will be required installing liners on the dam and then water can be pumped out so ledge construction can begin. Thanks for hanging with me through this discussion of design. I hope it helps you understand a little more about the project as you see the construction unfold. And I hope it also helps you understand how the wave is shaped once surfing begins here in a few months. Make sure and subscribe to the Town of Woodfin's YouTube channel so you'll get future updates. The next episode here in the next few weeks will cover construction underway in the riverbed.